Hello everyone, it's me again, it's Ivy, your physical therapist, your doctor of physical therapy. My channel is all about health and wellness, nature, investing, and plans for mental health. Subscribe, like, and share. Thank you for watching. Have a blessed day. Good evening, everyone. This is Ivy, your physical therapist, your doctor of physical therapy, your certified lymphedema therapist. I hope everyone had a great day today. Um, I'm going to hop in here and talk a little bit about what is lymphedema. Okay, so I have been doing a series of videos just for um, information, for education, for my clients and for families that have a member that has lymphedema um, from different causes. Okay, so today I would like, what can we do if we are diagnosed of lymphedema? Okay, so we know that um, lymphedema is a medical condition because of an abnormal swelling of a part of the extremities. It could be our upper body, our lower body, the trunk. Actually, the, all parts of the body can have lymphedema. And what is the reason or the cause for this? Uh, lymphedema is caused by the failure of our lymphatic system to eliminate or get rid of lymph fluid into the circulation. So there is an abnormal protein-rich fluid buildup outside the tissue cells of the body. And lymphedema is an abnormal swelling of the extremities, the trunk, and other parts of our body due to the failure of the lymphatic system to eliminate or to get rid of the lymph fluid into the circulation. There is an abnormal buildup or increased protein-rich fluid in the outside of the tissue cells of the body. The lymphatic system is developed as an offshoot of the venous system from the veins consisting of um, the lymphatic system consists of lymph vessels, lymph nodes, and lymph ducts that transport lymph fluid throughout the body in an open system. There are three main functions of our lymphatic system. We have the first main function is our lymphatic system is considered as an immune system. It circulates protein-rich fluid throughout our body to collect bacteria, viruses, and waste products. And another function of our lymphatic system is it functions as an absorption. So lymphatic system will carry fluid and other harmful substances such as bacteria, viruses, and other waste products through our lymph vessels into the lymph nodes. These wastes are then filtered out by the lymphocytes. What is a lymphocyte? A lymphocyte is an infection-fighting cells that live in our lymph nodes. And ultimately, this will be flushed from our body. Okay, and the third main function of our lymphatic system is the fluid balance. Fluid balance, so there is a balance of fluid in our body. The system helps maintain the fluid balance in the body by collecting excess fluid and other particulate matter or waste products from the tissues and depositing them into the bloodstream. There, it will go through the circulation and will be um, taken out of the body through the excretory system. So those are the three main functions of our lymphatic system. It is unity for our immune system, it's for absorption, and lastly, it is also for fluid balance. All right, so this was what I was talking about. The three main functions of the lymphatic system is a fluid. Um, it functions as a fluid balance system. It is an immune system and it's for absorption. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. This is what it looks like. This is our lymphatic system. If you see in this picture, um, the whole body, this green, um, this is a green colored, uh, like roots or it looks like roots but these are lymphatic system we have over here we get the cervical lymph nodes we get 
the cervical lymph nodes here, right here. We have the axillary lymph nodes right over here and then the other side. We get the spleen. Actually, the spleen is part of our lymphatic system. And then over here, down at the back portion, we have the lumbar lymph nodes. And we have the pelvic lymph nodes. And then we have, we actually have the inguinal lymph nodes here on this side here, going down to our extremities. And at the back of the knee, we got the popliteal lymph nodes also there. And all of this green, you might not show up so clear on your on the screen, but all these greens, green um, stuff on the whole body is our lymphatic system. Okay, so we have the lymphatic system. We we have the circulatory system. We know earlier that the lymphatic system is an offshoot of our venous system in which our venous system is part of the circulatory system. We're so familiar with the circulatory system. We get the veins and the arteries. So the red, the red colored color here is the red, which is which are the which is the artery. I'm so sorry. Artery. It is oxygen-rich blood. It consists of consists of oxygen-rich blood. And the blue in the picture is the oxygen poor blood. So that's our venous system. All right, let me stop the share. Okay, so our circulatory system or the cardiovascular system, what is the function of our circulatory system in comparison to our lymphatic system? Our circulatory system or our cardiovascular system, which consists of the heart and the blood vessels, the blood vessels which consisted of our arteries and our veins, they deliver nutrients and oxygen to all the cells in the body. That's the main function of our circulatory system. Okay, and um, go, uh, going forward, if we compare the circulatory system to the lymphatic system, um, the circulatory system, the blood flows from the arteries and it goes to the capillaries, to the veins, and then it goes back to the heart. So it's like a closed system. From the arteries, it goes to the capillaries and then it goes to the veins and back to the heart. And it supplies nutrients, with an oxygenated blood to the cells of the body. So then from the cells of the body, there's no oxygen. The blood from there is not non-oxygenated. The blue blood goes back to the circulation, back to the heart. Once it reaches the heart, it becomes an oxygenated blood. That's why in the picture earlier, um, it was a red colored um, circulation or the red blood, which is rich in oxygen. On the other hand, our lymphatic system, we know that they consist of the lymphatic vessels, the lymphatic trunk, the collecting trunk, the veins and the bloodstreams, and we have those lymph nodes as well. And they function as an absorption system, as an immune system, and then as a fluid balance. So unlike the circulatory system, our lymphatic system is an open circuit, meaning it, it, it goes from one direction to the other and it has it doesn't come back to the heart it just go back to the side and then back to the other side so that's our lymphatic and circulatory system but let me share you again this i want you to see so that you will have an idea what is lymph edema what does it look like um, i'm just going to show you this picture of this lymph edema so slideshow Look at this. Over here, this is the upper body. As I've said, the lymph edema can affect the whole part of the body. So over here, it shows up. Um, this is an example of upper, upper arm or upper extremity lymph edema. It's usually, usually either caused by um, cancer or removal of the lymph node from the breast um, cancer or mastectomy and some other kinds of surgery that um, there is a need to remove the lymph node of the axilla or here, over here, the axillary lymph node, then it becomes like this. So there are stages of lymphedema also. We'll talk about that in the next video or in the videos to come. Over here in the middle, you see this is like a, this is a typical 
uh, a very common type of leg lymph edema. The cause here might be primary, meaning it's genetic or it's idiopathic, meaning they have it when they were born or when they in a certain at a certain age, or it could be from a parasite. I think um, in my other video I talk about the parasite called filariasis, which <clears throat> gets into the skin. Actually, it's caused by a mosquito bite, and it's not very common in in America. It's usually common in the tropical countries. And so, when the mosquito bites your skin, and they they have the parasite in it and it gets into your skin and it, you know it um, becomes a lymphedema which is caused by the parasite reacid, sorry. and it could also be caused by a removal of the inguinal lymph node if the person that has the lymphedema had have a cancer somewhere in the abdomen part or 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 in the prostate area or any 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 removal of tumor with a removal of the lymph node in the inguinal region it can also lead to lymphedema and it probably will look like this. Now, <clears throat> in this picture, in this picture, um, this is a neck lymphedema that's a cause, it looks like it's caused after, it is a side effect of radiation that causes the skin to be fibrotic and then there will be no more um, good circulation of the lymphatic system in this particular area. You can also have lymphedema on your face when there is a tumor or a cancer in the facial area or in the mouth area and then you remove some of the cervical lymph nodes here and it causes the face or part of your neck to get sw swollen swollen so those are some of the pictures of um, images of lymphedema of primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema so when you say primary lymphedema there is an absence of a the absence of the lymphatic system when the baby or someone is born um, with no lymphatic system and um, it's usually hereditary or genetic and you know, meaning they have that at a very young age because their primary lymphedema can occur from zero to birth and then from a certain age of from from birth to teenager is an abnormality or there is absence of part of the lymphatic system or the whole lymphatic system. Now, secondary lymphedema by the term itself secondary, it is caused by something. It is could be a procedure, it could be from cancer, it could be from radiation, from chemotherapy, filariasis, parasite infection. So that's, those are those are the two main types of lymphedema or classification of lymphedema. Primary lymphedema, which is the cause, could be unknown. It's genetic, it's idiopathic. Um, and then, of course, the secondary, which is secondary lymphedema due to the injury of the lymphatic system. Or maybe the, Okay, so... That's how you say telariasis. So you see right here, um, it's not very clear, but look at the, the picture of the leg. So this is what is a typical um, image of a leg with telariasis. So this is caused by a mosquito bite that gets, that this mosquito is a carrier of this parasite called, called filariasis, gets into your skin and gets into your bloodstream and into your lymphatic system. And then it develops into it's like a worm that develops um, and that can uh, that can you know cause swelling of the lymphatic system because it will in, um, it happens on the leg part or the lower part of your body and it looks like this. We will talk about treatment in the succeeding um, video. So this is another picture right here of the primary types of uh, the types of primary lymph edema remember the genetic or the unknown cause so over here this is the lymph edema precox and the milroy's disease and the lymph edema tarda so um this is infancy so look at this little legs here this is already it, this is a picture of um children with lymph edema of their legs <clears throat> So that's the one. Okay, I'm back. All right, so um, 
I would like to talk about the signs and symptoms, signs and symptoms of lymphedema. How do we know that someone has lymphedema? Okay, the most common, most common um, signs that a person has lymphedema might have lymphedema is the swelling of a particular part of the body. It could be swelling of the arms, swelling of the legs, your fingers, your toes, it could be your face, your neck, everything. It's an abnormal swelling. So then you think like, okay, what's um, what's going on with this um, person? And then a particular person would also feel heaviness or tightness on a particular part of the body that, that is swollen or big. There is restriction of the range of motion. Sometimes it is painful, but the, they said that lymphedema is not, lymphedema itself is not painful. What causes the pain if there is a very enlarged joint or enlarged part of the body and it's so heavy and it's so full of fluid that it pinches the the nerve endings on the on where the affectation is that causes the pain or it could be from the joint problem that the patient already have then that causes pain for a person with lymphedema and it's usually when when part of your body is big and swollen um it's the, this you know it's not very comfortable Another another problem is discomfort and ache and pain. And then because you have swelling on that part of the body, um, infection is always recurring, recurrent, meaning you always have problem with recurring infections. There is also fibrosis or hardening or thickening of the skin that has been affected by the lymphedema. All right, so there are stages of lymphedema. The stages of lymphedema, it, um, stage zero, there is no visible edema or injury to the lymphatic system. You, you do not see any swelling or edema on the part of the body that's affected. Now that's stage zero. Now why do you have to stage that if there's no edema? Now this usually of course if um, for secondary lymphedema, like say for example, you have mastectomy and your doctor remove some part of your lymph nodes, then we know for a fact that removing the lymph node, which is some one of the main part of lymphatic system, is already an injury, you know, to the lymphatic system. Um, even though there is no visible edema, we know that there was an injury, then we stage that as zero. Now we can go to stage one, which is there is a visible edema, which is pitting edema. So you, you know, pitting edema, you push your hand in here and then it's the edema stays in there. Like, you know, like there is an indentation that you see visibly, that's stage one. Now stage two is you, uh, there is a visible edema. It could be as, you know, as big or as as big or, or the same size as stage one, the only difference is in stage two, it's a non-pitting edema. And on the stage three of a lymphedema, there is visible edema. You can see that there's swelling and there's edema of the, of the part that's been affected. There is also a skin discoloration. There's a change in color. It's usually it could be purplish or more like brown or darker compared to the rest of the, the skin of the body. And it is also very hard or thickened. So that's stage three. So we have zero, one, two, and three. Those are the three stages of lymphedema. Okay. So how do we diagnose or how do we know we have lymphedema? Diagnosing a, um, diagnosing a person who, ha, you know, who might have lymphedema um, entails a complete assessment of the body system. We have to perform a thorough assessment or evaluation of the whole body system, not just where the affectation is. It is a rule of thumb that a definitive diagnosis of lymphedema and its causative factor is unique for each client. So you have to assess a patient or a client as an individual person, not just, you know, like a generalized um, assessment of a lymphedema. So if you are at risk of lymphedema because you just had surgery um, that involves removing your lymph nodes or cutting parts of your lymphatic system, such as for clients with um, cancer surgeries, then your doctor 
may diagnose you with having lymphedema based on the signs and symptoms and the history of the removal of the lymph node or cutting of the parts of your lymphatic system because of the cancer, um, uh, cancer diagnosis. However, if the cause of your lymphedema is not from a surgical procedure, so then the doctor has to have imaging tests. They do some imaging tests or to further investigate if it is a lymphatic system that's problematic or it could be the veins or your artery before the doctor can give you a definitive diagnosis of lymphedema. So those are the two main considerations. Um, if you have the surgery done because of removal of a lymph node from your cancer or, or um, removal of cutting parts of your lymphatic system, then for sure you have lymphedema. On the other hand, if there is no surgical procedure that, and then you're showing some of the signs and symptoms of a client or a patient that have might have lymphedema, then the doctor will order further imaging um, tests or procedures to rule out lymphedema. So what are some of the most common tests that the doctor will um, have you do? A very popular one is the Doppler ultrasound. So first, you you know, like I, I, I see a lot of clients with lymphedema. It is very crucial before you do your treatment for lymphedema is you want to make sure there is no blood clot in the area that you will be treating. So then you have to do a Doppler ultrasound. So the Doppler ultrasound is very common in our, our um, you know, clinical setting like even without lymphedema if the patient is showing signs of signs and symptoms of pain on a particular part of the body with swelling and redness we always try to um, order a doppler ultrasound just to make sure there is no blood clot on the area where the affectation or the swelling or the pain is so what is a doppler ultrasound a doppler ultrasound it is a conventional ultrasound that looks onto the blood flow and pressure using a high frequency sound waves. This will detect if the area has blood clot or um, Im uh, embolus in the area. Okay, so that's the Doppler. Also further investigate and we'll, uh, we'll do a CT scan. The CT scan will reveal if there is any blockages and a blockage of the lymphatic system say if the doctor will do a CT scan of the whole leg or the upper body and it will also show us if there is a, a blockage of the lymphatic system now if there is a blockage of the lymphatic system then we know for sure that this patient has lymphedema all right another one is if the CT scan will not show any any um any blockages and you're you're still wanting to know if it's really lymphedema because the the venous and the arterial arterial um test or procedures is saying it's negative there's no problem with the vein or artery so we're assuming it's the lymphatic system and then the ct scan doesn't show any of the blockages then we go further investigate so the doctor might or may have the patient do an mri scan a magnetic resonance imaging it's a more highly um highly a non-invasive technical um, high frequency uh, type of procedure to see if the patient has lymphedema. Now, some doctors, especially doctors that are so um, that are seeing most lymphedema patients, and they will do what they call a lymphocentigraphy. Lymphocentigraphy. I will put down in the link below what is um, lymphocentigraphy and all these other things that I'm talking about in this video. So lymphocentigraphy is a radionuclide imaging. It's like an MRI, but it has a radionuclide imaging of the um, lymphatic system. A radioactive dye is injected into the lymphatic system, and then a machine will scan, um, you know, the part of the, the body that's been tested. Or And then the result of these images will show the dye moving from your lymph vessels and can highlight if there is any blockages. 
So it's basically almost the same as MRI. Um, the only uh, difference is in here, they have to uh, they have to put a radionuclide dye on the lymphatic system through injection in order for for the scan to see more specifically where the problem is if there's any blockages. So those are some of the tests that the doctor will um, order for the patient to um, to to be tested in order to rule out if he or she has a lymph edema. Mm. Okay, so, so we already know what is lymphedema and uh, what are the signs and symptoms. How do we diagnose lymphedema? Now, knowing that a person already has lymphedema and we are really sure that this patient or client that want to see you in the clinic or that you want to see at home to, to assess the condition if it's a lymphedema or if it's a true lymphedema or not a true lymphedema. So then we know with all the tests done, with your assessment, with your observation assessment and um, history taking, the patient has lymphedema. So what can we do as a lymphedema therapist? What do we really do? Okay, so we have the gold standard treatment for lymphedema, which we call complete decongestive therapy. So the term itself decongestive, meaning you want to decongest the area that's been very congested with fluid, with protein-rich fluid, because of um, the lymphatic system's disruption in its pathway or flow of the lymphatic fluid, because of whatever reason it is. Now, this complete decongestive therapy, which we usually um, very popularly known as CDT treatment, this is a non-invasive treatment that it comprises of manual lymphatic drainage or manual lymph drainage, compression bandaging, decongestive exercises, compression stockings or compression garments that could either be a regular type of compression garment or stockings, or it could be a custom-made um, compression stocking or garment. So those are the um, components of a complete decongestive therapy. Manual lymphatic drainage, compression bandaging, decongestive exercises, compression stockings or garments. Now, um, this complete decongestive therapy started in the 1970s in Europe. And in the US, this became well known in the 1980s. So those are a little history of um, complete decongestive therapy or lymph edema therapy. Okay, so there are two phases of treatment. So before when I used to work in a nursing home, um, we still do these two phases of treatment. And then when I, um, you know, like every setting, you still have to follow these phases of treatment. You just have to modify how you're gonna do it because different settings is, you know, different like skilled nursing facility. The patient is in the skilled nursing facility. Outpatient, the patient goes to your clinic and do the therapy there. Now, when you do home health therapy, you go to the patient's house and do your, your lymphedema therapy there for the patient. So phase one, phase one consists of skin care, manual lymphatic drainage, decongestive exercises, compression therapy. So if you think about it, you all those complete decongestive therapy has to be done in phase one. So phase one, the goal of the treatment is to obtain max, maximum reduction of the fluid to to, to get the, the, the fluid size and volume to decrease as much as you can. So in this phase, the certified lymphedema therapist um, that sees the patient usually does all the therapy, meaning you do everything for the patient. And you, well, you know, while doing all the treatment, you're, of course, you have to start educating the patient. Education starts from the day you see the patient to gather history and to get to know the patient and do the complete assessment. And every time you go back or the patient goes back to see you, education continues as well. Now, in this is a phase one is a comprehensive, um, complete decongestive therapy. Now, when you go to the phase two, that means it's called self-management. The goal of self uh, the goal of phase two, which is self-management, is for maintenance. You want to make sure that the patient will be able to manage the condition, will be able to perform self-management 
of complete decongestive therapy for herself or for himself. Now, if he can, if he or she can't do it alone, then you need to educate or train the family member or the caregiver to do the maintenance therapy, which also still consists of complete decongestive therapy. Okay, so that's the two phases of treatment for lymphedema. Okay, so the big question now is who can treat a lymphedema patient? Is there a specific, um, do you have to be a bachelor's degree or doctorate degree to have uh, to, to treat a lymphedema patient? Or what is, is, what is the specialty to get into in, to, to enroll or to train yourself in order to see this, this group of patients um, to execute the completely congestive therapy? Who can treat lymphedema patient? Or the very simple answer to the simple question is, the one that can treat the lymphedema patients are the certified lymphedema therapists. And who are these certified lymphedema therapists? Who can be a certified lymphedema therapist? Okay. Um, can I be a lymphedema therapist or can you be a lymphedema therapist? What is the criteria? What's the requirement to become a certified lymphedema therapist? Now, speaking of who can be a certified lymphedema therapist or a CLT, I am a physical therapist. I can be a lymphedema therapist. So to answer your question, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a nurse, a massage therapist, a doctor, or any medical professionals who will undergo lymphedema certification training and education can be a certified lymphedema therapist. So in other words, um, you know, when it's a PT, OT nurse, massage therapist, they have a, a lot of medical background. Now, you, you just have to go to this, you have to go to a training school to become a certified lymphedema therapist. In my case, I went to the Academy of Lymphatic Studies and I'm uh, there, are, uh, there are other schools that you can enroll. Um, we, we have Northern School. We have Close Aid Training. Um, you know, those are the three ones, top three ones. There might be some little schools or like other schools that I, I'm not mentioning right now. But I can I can only speak highly of Acad the Academy of Lymphatic Studies because that's where I got my training. So um, it is a comprehensive training or education seminar or whatever you call it, but it's a training for me. It, con it consists of um, knowing the, the whole anatomy, path, uh, the physiology and the, pathophysiolo the pathology of, you know, like the lymphatic system and the pathology and physiology of lymphedema. And of course, the how do we execute the complete decongestive therapy and then after all those training you will have to undergo a specific um certification examination you have to pass the test you have to pass a written exam and of course the hands-on examination you have to pass those two um, exams in order for you to get your certification to become a certified lymphedema therapist then after that when you have your certification then you can see lymphedema patients so that's the answer to the question who can treat lymphedema patients